Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. We're glad to be back together. We're going to pray for us and then we'll get right into our passage for tonight. Father, thank you so much for this chance to come and open your word and for able to be back together again. And Lord, we ask now that what you have for us tonight would take root in our hearts, that we wouldn't just glean information, that we would actually grow in not just knowledge, but in wisdom, which is acting out and living out what you've revealed to us and the knowledge that we have. Father, I pray that as we talk about submission to authority, and especially in this world in which we live today, we need your wisdom when it comes to this. We don't need a set of formulas. We need your wisdom in each situation as we're going to take a look at tonight as to how we would bring you glory by submitting to the authority that you've put over us. And so, Lord, we ask now, that as we go into an area that a lot of us, all of us, because of the flesh, don't like, may we see the beauty of your plan. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Paul goes on and says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror of good to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, we must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Now, as you heard me pray or say in the prayer... We're going to be dealing with submission to God's authority tonight. And I'm just going to tell you ahead of time, we need to keep this in mind as we go where we're going to go. We're going to be talking about things that make some people mad. And because we all don't like authority. And I'll show you why that is in just a second. But here's what we need to keep in mind as we study these verses tonight. God is the one who instituted authority in this world. Look at that again, Romans 13, 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist, all the authorities that we're going to look at tonight that exist, have been instituted by who? God. And therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Now, there's a lot of questions that jump into your mind, and I tell you to hang on to them. We're going to deal with them all. What about if the government's bad and all this stuff? We're going to deal with all that stuff, but let's, let's lay the foundation first. Let's not jump ahead. Let's allow the scriptures to speak to us. If you rebel against authority, you are rebelling against something that God has designed. Now, our rebellion against authority can be traced all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve questioned God's authority. They questioned his word. And they wanted to make their own decisions and be their own authority. If you remember, that's what Satan tempted them with. You get to be like God, determining right and wrong, good and evil. God had said, look, I, I'm giving you a command. I'm actually giving you freedom to eat from any of the trees in the garden except one. And I command you not to eat from this one tree. And the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Satan comes on and said, did God really say... And he tempted them and said, the only reason God doesn't want you to eat from that tree is he knows the moment you eat from that tree, you get to be like him and you get to be God. You get to determine right and wrong. You get to call the shots. By the way, isn't that the exact same sin that got Satan removed from his position that he had in heaven? He wanted to be God. And folks, let me just say this to you. Even though we're born again, even though we've been saved. Even though we've given Jesus our life, we are still in this flesh. And just like Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't. And the things I don't want to do, I do. Who will save me? Every one of us needs to acknowledge in your flesh, even though you're saved, you still want to call the shots. You still want to determine 
how things are done. You want to be the final authority in your life. And we have to be willing to lay that down. That's why daily, as we saw in chapter 12 of Romans, we're to offer our flesh as a living sacrifice. And when we do so, and we're not conformed to the pattern of this world, which is living for self, we'll know what his will is. The will of our authority. So, go to 1 John chapter 5. And I want you to see that not only do you have this problem in your flesh. We have a world that says you get to live that way. 1 John chapter 5, look at verses 15 through 17. 1 John 5 verses 15 through 17. This is what it says here. Sorry, chapter 2. I said 5. 1 John 2 verses 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, we just talked about that, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Don't miss what's going on. We not only are living in our fleshly bodies, that are still wanting to be God. We live in a world that says you can be God. You get to decide your sex. You get to decide how you're going to live your life and what you think is right and wrong. You get to call the shots. And folks, the Bible is very clear that those of us who are in Christ have submitted the rights. We have submitted ourselves to Jesus. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse 15. Passage of scripture that I don't think a lot of us have cross-stitched on our wall. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 15. And he, Jesus, died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves... But for him who for their sake died and was raised. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul said. I no longer live. The life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. Folks, you surrendered the rights to your life when you said, Jesus, my life is yours. I receive you as my Savior and Lord. And folks, as we talk about the fact that God has designed authority, we need to let the scripture speak and the Holy Spirit speak to us because this is something we all wrestle with on many different levels, as you're going to see. And especially in these days that we're in, we need a biblical Holy Spirit led response to what's going on around us. So let's go down that road. All authority in this life, by the way, points to who? To God, the final and ultimate authority. Go back to Exodus chapter 20. When God gave the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, look at verses 1 through 6. It says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And that includes you. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. God said at the very beginning, when he gave him the Ten Commandments, he said, you'll have no other gods. In other words, I am the only God. I am the final authority. All authority that is in this world, and we're going to talk about some of those authorities, all point to the ultimate authority, the one who's designed authority, the one who created everything and has put things in order. And even when he created the angels, there's different levels and ranks of authority in the angels. If you've ever studied the angels, there's different levels and ranks of authority. And who determines? that God did and all through scripture the Bible says there's different levels of responsibility and roles that we've all been given here on this earth and who determines whether we're male or female who determines what our roles are going to be who determines how we're to live our lives God is the one who's done that and we didn't submit ourselves to that yet even in the church today we have plenty of preachers that'll tell you, you can be anything you want to be you can dream anything you want to do 
But the Bible teaches that actually John the Baptist said he must increase, I must decrease. Jesus himself took the role of a servant and submitted himself to the Father, even though that submission to the Father meant death on a cross. Are we going to be willing to live the life that God has designed for us? Oh, you'll find his yoke is easy and his burden is light if you submit yourself to what he's got designed for you. But first and foremost, we need to renew our minds to the fact that there is authority in this world. And God is the ultimate authority who made all different levels of authority and they all point to him. And rebellion against any type of authority is rebellion against God. Now we're going to talk about that in great detail tonight. Do you know that the Bible says there's authority in our families? Right here in Exodus 20, look at verse 12. He tells us to honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Jump over to Ephesians 6. It goes into a little more detail there. Ephesians chapter 6, look at verses 1 through 4. Children, obey. There's that word that most people have taken out of our wedding vows. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. He then, we can just stop there for now, but let me just say this to you. The Bible actually says that God has set up authority in the home and in our families, and that the parents are the authorities over their children. Let me say this to you. Why does it say that you live long in the land? Here's why. Because when you're little, you don't know that chasing your ball across the street could get you killed. When you're little, you don't know that sticking a screwdriver in the electric so socket is not a smart thing to do. But mom and dad have been given that role of authority. They've been down the road and they are to command, if you will. Why? Because they want you to live. <laughs> and there's a blessing in that. God designed authority for you for a reason. But at the same time, we all struggled when we were kids. Remember, you don't even remember this partially, but if you've ever raised kids, you probably hopefully willing to acknowledge you used to do the same thing. But you ever told a kid it was nap time? Was there automatic response? You're the authority. I'll gladly do it. No, we come into this world wanting to be in charge. It's, we're born with this problem. And God designed authority in our families. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. By the way, at some point, you're going to bristle. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse 3. But I want you to understand that the head of every man... Sorry, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 22 through 23. Ephesians 5, 22 through 23. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. By the way, let me just say this to you tonight. We're not going to take the time to break these things all down. My teaching is not on submission, wives submitting to their husbands, because there's a depth of teaching to that. And let me just say this quickly, though, that this word submit in the Greek is the Greek word hypotasso, and it means a voluntary submission due to respect for God's authority and God's design. So any husband that tries to pull out the God's word says you must submit, that's not what the word says. The God's word says that you must choose on your own. I can't force it. And I should not force it. It's a choice that the wife makes. It's a choice that the children make. That's why fathers were not to exasperate their children and be jerks as parents with the authority they've been given. In 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit, the Bible actually talks about in the authority that pastors have in the church, not to lord their authority over those entrusted to them. But folks, the Bible's clear. There's authority in the home. With parents over the children, with husbands and their wives, there's a role that God has designed for all of us. And if we're honest, there's going to be some point that we go, I don't like that. Okay, let's go back to the beginning of our lesson. Whenever you rebel against any authority, you're rebelling against who? God, who set it up that way. There's authority in the church. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Jen, can I say something? Go for it. Go ahead. So, um, when you were referencing early on, um, 1 John, 
Mm -hmm. The verses that are just immediately before that mm -hmm. hit me because it does talk about spiritual maturity. Yes. And so it takes a great deal of spiritual maturity to be able to live a life of, of you know, submission um, in its proper order. Right. And that's why it talks about little children, like what you've been talking about, and then the, the young men. Yep. And I say to you, fathers. With all the testing and everything yep. else, but the fathers, I've written to you. Right. You know this. Yep. You know, so it... For those that are listening, Sheila is saying that the passage, in the passage in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17 that talk about the world, the verses around that all talk about the fact that it takes spiritual maturity to be able to get to the level. That's why it's hard for me to teach. I just, right now I'm laying the foundation that a spiritual authority is there. It's been designed by God. But at the same time, like you're saying, it's going to take wisdom. As you're going to see, hopefully, and this will deal with what I think you're pointing to, Sheila, is... When we truly understand who's in control, a wife can submit to her husband because he's not in control. When we truly understand who's ultimately in control, a child can obey their parents because, you know what, they're not really in control. This is a spiritual depth that you're talking about. Is that what you're going to? Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, mm -hmm. Over and over again in those verses, it talks about how, you know, the young men, you will overcome the wicked. You know, we have to be able to learn the word, know the word, apply it to our hearts, understand it in its proper right. you know, context and everything so that we can live a life of submission. I can't do it on my own. Exactly. And we're going to head that. And we're, tonight, we're going to get there because I'm going to show you some things that you might not have ever seen in the Bible when it comes to this type of submission. So let's, let's chase it some more. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 through 13. Listen to what it says. It was, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are, what's the next words? Over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Did you catch that? In the church, God's designed authority in the church and we don't like that. We want a church where we all have an equal vote. But actually, I was teaching on this in a church in New Orleans years and years ago and how God designed elders and leaders in the church to be in charge spiritually. And that's God's design. I think the Bible teaches that there should be input and the family and the church members should all have equal input. But the actual decision is put in the hands of those who've been given this authority. I finished preaching this at a church. I was out in the foyer of church in this, this church in New Orleans and just saying hi to people afterwards. And a man walks up to me and he goes, respect is earned. And I said, hang on for a second. You need to sit down. He goes, why is that? I go, because you didn't hear the sermon and I got to re-preach it. <laughs> this passage doesn't say respect them once they earn it. You esteem them in high regard because of the role that God has given them. You're respecting them, not because they're respectable, but because God has given them that role. You're respecting God. By respecting them. Do you understand? And that's where we're going to be head heading in a little bit. Go to Hebrews 13, verse 17. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders. There's that word again. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no advantage to you. This sounds almost like what we just read about in Romans 13, isn't it? That if we submit to the governing authorities, that'll be a good thing for us. If we rebel against them, it'll be a bad thing. And it's the same thing in the church. Go to 1 Peter 5. I referenced that one earlier. By the way, I can see on all your faces, you're really enjoying this lesson on authority. 1 <laughs> First Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5. Look at verses 1 through 5. Paul says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders." Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
So here we've seen God has designed authority in our homes. God's designed authority in our churches. He's also designed authority in our governments, in our city governments, our county, our state, national governments. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verses 13 and 17. Or through 17, 13 through 17. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, and remember who the emperor was at this time and what they were doing to Christians, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor who? The emperor. The emperor. But the emperor is a jerk. Yeah. But we're submitting to whose authority by honoring the emperor? God's. Let me just say something to you real quick. It grieves me that Christians would have, let's go Brandon, on their car. Because you and I know, you know what it's really saying. You know where that came from. And as Christians, that should never be our attitude toward those in authority over us. The Bible says we're to be praying for those in authority over us. Not saying F them. So, folks, I just pray that the Spirit of God would be allowed to speak to us because God wants to use us as salt and light in this world. And 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4 says, We don't fight with the same weapons the world fights with. The weapons we have have the power to demolish strongholds. And we, as Christians, need to submit ourselves to God's authority and submit ourselves to the governing authorities. But, Jim, what about? We'll answer that question. Don't go too far yet. Listen to me. The scripture has so clearly said already, have you not seen that we are to submit ourselves to whatever authority is over us because of God's design? Let's keep going. Go to Romans 13.1 again. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Well, he goes on, but, but he saved us, didn't he? Go back to verses 1 and 2. Remind them to be submissive to who? Rulers, Rulers and authorities. To be obedient, to be ready for every good work and to speak evil of no one. All right, Jim, I can't wait any longer. What if the government's evil? You know, the Bible speaks to this too. And I want to spend the time we have left tonight showing you from the scriptures what the Bible says it should be our response. Now, this goes back to what Sheila was talking about. This is where spiritual maturity and wisdom comes in. I'm not going to give you a formula today as to when you can rebel and when you can't. But the Bible does tell us what we're to be looking for and how we're to respond. But again... We are ultimately submitting to whose authority? God's. That's very important. Sometimes, and I'm going to show you scripturally most of the time, God will have you submit anyway to an evil government to show your respect for God's design of authority and to show your trust in his ultimate authority in your situation. Listen to that again. Many times, I wrote in my notes sometimes, but I also wrote most of the time, God will have you submit anyway to an evil government to show your respect for God's design of authority and to show your trust in his ultimate authority in your situation. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. We had just finished with, in verse 7, where it said, honor the emperor. I'm sorry, verse 17, where it said, honor the emperor. Look at now verses 18 through 25. 1 Peter 2, verses 18 through 25. Servants. Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good ones 
and the gentle ones, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Did you see it? There's going to be bad government. And we should be willing to submit ourselves because we're really trusting in God to take care of us. Are they doing things with your money that you don't like? Sure. Pay your taxes. Is your church not spending the money the way you think they ought to spend it? Possibly. There are humans involved. Give your tithes. Give your gifts. Give your offerings. Because if you try and control it after you've given it, it ain't a gift. I don't sit back and decide whether or not my church is spending the money the way I think they ought to spend it. God told me to give to the storehouse, and I do. And God takes care of it from there. They'll be responsible for how they handle God's money. I gave it as a gift. And once it leaves my house, I don't worry about it anymore. But a lot of us sit around talking about how our money is being spent in this situation. And the money I gave here, and they're not spending it wisely. Who's wanting to be in charge still? Years ago, when I was associate pastor of a church in New Orleans, this man made a donation of 100 choir chairs to the choir for their practice room. It was a big church, and they had a big choir. And they, he bought 100 chairs, and they nice, comfortable chairs, like you're sitting in, and, and put them in the choir room as a gift. Well, one day, he was walking down one of the halls in the church, and he saw one of the chairs he bought in another classroom. He went storming into the pastor's office. I happened to be in the, associate, uh, in the pastor's office as an associate pastor. I was sitting in there, and the guy stormed in. And he said, I saw one of my chairs in a classroom. I gave those to the choir. I demand you do something about it. And the pastor said, we'll do something right away. The guy went, left, went home. He tossed me his car keys, truck keys. He said, go get my pickup truck. Meet me back by the choir room. So I went and drove his truck around to the choir room, and we literally stacked them all up in the pickup truck real high, tied them over with ropes, and drove them to his house and started unloading them on his lawn. (laughs) He comes running out. What are you doing? And the pastor says, we're giving you your chairs back. He goes, I gave those to the church. The pastor said, did you? Because it seems like you're still controlling them like they're yours. Folks. You don't realize it. When you complain about how your money's being spent, you're still wanting to be God. John chapter 19. Peter. How do you reconcile that with, with, um, you know, he has told you, old man, what is required of you to Mm -hmm. do justice. Right. Love mercy. How you you handle that in the situation is you then say, Lord, show me where you want me to give and where you don't. Exactly. That's it. I'm talking, talking about, about once you give it. it he, he tells us to do justice. So right. within, the, within the scope of I think, the authority that we have as, as children of yes. God. Yes. Let, let me, I, I'm going to say your question is going to be answered. Okay. You're, it's going to be answered, but you've got to stick with me. All right? Okay. So don't run ahead. <laughs> I know your brain's always three steps ahead of me, Sheila. Stick with me. John 19, look at verses 10 and 11. We just saw in 1 Peter 2 that actually Jesus gave us an example. And it said that he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. In John 19, verses 10 and 11, look what it says. Pilate said to Jesus, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. In other words, Jesus looked at Pilate and said, I'm not even looking at you. I'm looking beyond you to the one who's really in control. And this is the role the father had said for me. And he said he was going to do this and I'm to submit to it. Do you realize there's no formula? And this goes back to a little bit of answering what you're talking about, Sheila. We need the wisdom of God in each situation because we could all of a sudden take over and determine what doing justly is. We got to let the spirit of God show us because in one instance, Paul uh, is about to be beaten by Roman soldiers in Acts chapter 22. And he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you guys legally able to beat a Roman citizen without a trial? They said, you're a Roman citizen. He goes, yeah. And they quickly let him go. Yet prior to that in Acts 16, in a Roman colony of Philippi, 
He didn't pull out the Roman citizen card and he took a beating. And he was thrown in the inner cell with, in stocks. Well, maybe he didn't know about that law. No, he knew. When the beating was over and the jailer and his family get saved, the magistrate sent some people to go release him. And he said, oh, no, no. They publicly beat us two Roman citizens without a trial. You tell them to come publicly release us. Did he know? In that instance, the Holy Spirit told him, take the beating. Did he say, take the beating because the jailer and his family are going to get saved? No. He just told him to take the beating. Sometimes the Spirit of God is going to tell you to bite your lip and just submit to it. But we want to be God and we like to use Scripture to back up our being in charge. The Scripture says, you know, be careful. What's the Spirit of God in the Scripture saying together now? What's He saying in this situation? In some instances, He's going to say, pull out the Roman citizen card. Other times, He's going to say, don't. Keep it in your pocket. One instance, Paul was arrested, or sorry, not arrested, but he was dragged out of the city, stoned, left for dead. You know what he does? He gets back up and walks back in the city. Yet in another instance, he finds out they're going to try to kill him, and he sneaks in a basket out a window and out the wall in the middle of the night. So which is it? Exactly. You need the Spirit of God to show you when to submit and when you're not to submit to those authority, but still submit to the authority, which we're going to get to in a second. But there's more to this than you realize. Go to Acts 23. I'm going to show you. I think there's a level to this that many of us have never really looked at because we want the formula. Acts 23, verses 1 through 5. And Paul here, looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, yet contrary to the law you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I, I didn't know, he, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it's written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. In that instance, Paul got mad and said, how dare you, you jerk? And they said, are you going to talk like that to the high priest? And Paul quickly submitted himself and said, I didn't know that he was the high priest. I wouldn't have said that if I had known. I wouldn't have reacted that way. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. I want you to put yourself... I don't know, but he just said, I didn't know. You remember, and back at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, there were a couple guys that were kind of, one was, and it was father-in-law. He might, through all the stuff he'd gone through, he might not have known who was in charge at that time. If he said, if the scripture says he said he didn't know, he didn't know. Go to 2 Kings chapter 5. I want you to put yourself in the situation of this little girl. Remember, she was taken captive when this... Enemy nation came in and captured her and kidnapped her. 2 Kings 5, verses 1 through 3 says, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord would die. Is that what she says? No. no. Would that my Lord were, the pro were with the prophet who's in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. Isn't that interesting? She had been taken captive by an enemy nation and was served to serve as a slave. And when her master got leprosy, she didn't sit there and say, good. She actually wanted him to know God. And she submitted herself in the role that had been given her. And she was actually used of God that this man would become a believer. And she was a prisoner. Go to Daniel chapter 4. Look at verses 19 through 27. Daniel 4, 19 through 27. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts were alarm, alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered as Daniel said, and said, My lord, may the dream be for those who hate you, and its interpretation for your enemies. 
The tree you saw which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field found shade and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots on, in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It's a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king, that you should be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field you shall be made to eat grass like an ox and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules therefore O king let my counsel be acceptable to you break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed for there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity when Daniel was given this dream and this vision and he gives it to Nebuchadnezzar he says oh I wish this was for your enemies and not for you wait a minute how did Daniel end up in Babylon? He was captured. He was taken into captivity. But, and we're going to head somewhere now with this. God was the one who had decreed that the nation of Israel, because of their disobedience, was going to go into captivity. And he submitted himself to the fact that God said it was going to happen. And he submitted himself to it. And he wanted those who were there to know that there is a God. And how did he do it? By his submission to their authority because all authority had been designed by God. But other times, where you're running, yep. Up front, he was willing to stand on his conviction and ask for permission to, you know, let me not take it that the king's food. Right. 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 That's where we're heading next. You're still running ahead of me, Sheila. You've got to wait. Now, other times, listen closely. Because the government or authority is telling us to go against God's clear commands, we must rebel in order to show our submission to God's ultimate authority. Listen closely to what we said earlier. Sometimes in submission to God's design for authority, for his purposes, we are, if not many times, to submit ourselves to the governing authorities, even though we don't like what they're doing. Yet, there will be times that they command us to do something that clearly breaks the command of God. And we would be sinning against the command of God, who is the ultimate authority by submitting to our authorities in that way. And in those instances, and the spirit of God is going to show you when and how you are to submit to the ultimate authority, which is God and rebel. Right. You go to jail. And you may go to jail. Go to Acts chapter four. The spirit of maturity and how to rebel. The spirit of maturity is going to show you how to rebel. Go to Acts chapter 4. I think that's a great way to put it. The how to rebel is how the spirit of God. But again, go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 verses 1 through 20. In Acts chapter 4. Now let me just say this to you because I can already see it starting to happen a little bit in your tables here. Um, this is where you need to make sure you don't try to be God in the lives of the people around you. This is where a lot of Christians... Start arguing with each other about how we should rebel or when we should rebel. No. you got a problem, remember? You want to be God. And you even want to tell your brother and sister how they're to react. I'm saying to you, let the Holy Spirit lead you. Listen to Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. In Acts chapter 4, and if I went to Acts instead of Romans, I'd be there ready to read for you. Acts chapter 4, listen to what it says in verses 1 and following. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power and by what name did you do this? 
Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with, they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing before them or beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. In this instance, they were told, don't speak anymore about Jesus. They said, ah, actually, that's somewhere where we're going to submit to the only authority. We can't not preach in the name of Jesus. And they rebelled. Oh, by the way, what happened? Did they say, okay, go on, have a good day? No, they, if you read the next verse, they were beaten for it. But they rejoiced that they were able to suffer for his name. Go back to Daniel. Remember the Daniel that submitted? He and his buddies, who were taken captive, didn't always submit. In Daniel chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, we see his buddies Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you don't serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if he doesn't, if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. By the way, why were they not willing to worship the, his gods and the golden images that, the image that he had made? Do you remember Exodus chapter 20? Verses 1 and following, you'll have no other gods before me. And when the government said, you must worship. By the way, we're heading that for that way. After the church is gone during the tribulation period, there's going to be a one world government. And you're either going to take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist in his image. Or you're going to be killed. I pray you're not here having to make that choice at this time. But I'm going to tell you ahead of time, make the decision now. Book your ticket. I like that. Go to Daniel 6. The same Daniel that submitted himself to the authorities, as Sheila was talked about earlier, when they were in the early part of their captivity, they were willing to submit except when it broke, it broke God's commands. In Daniel 6, verses 1 through 10, it pleased Darius, now he's under the Persian rule, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom and over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one to whom these satraps could, should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault, because he was faithful, and no error or fault was found in him. He was living in submission to the authorities. Then the men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and they said to him, O King Darius, live forever. 
All the high officials of the kingdom and the prefects and the satraps and the counselors and the governors agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and he gave thanks before his God had he had done previously. He rebelled. You need wisdom. You need wisdom. But we need to keep in mind that we have a daily struggle with authority. And God has designed authority. And I'm about to take this to a level that some of you might not be very comfortable with. But I've got to tell you what God told me to say. Go back to Romans chapter 13. Look at verses 2 through 6. There's, there's another aspect of this passage in Romans 13 that many miss. We get so caught up in the, when do we rebel? When do we not rebel? All this stuff. And we miss something that God said here. In Romans 13 verses 2 through 6. Listen closely. Therefore, whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God. There it is again, twice. He's God's servant. An avenger who carries out the ra God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For this reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. And honor to whom honor is owed. Through this passage, Paul says over and over that governments, listen, Governments are God's servants, his ministers to execute God's judgment sometimes. Does that mean God's only going to use good governments to execute his judgment? No, read your Bibles. Actually, if you know the story of the nation of Israel and how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ended up in Babylon... And then under the Medes and the Persians is because of their disobedience to God and his ultimate authority. And he had already told them, if you obey me, I will let you live long in this land. If you don't, I'm going to have you taken captive. And because of their continual disobedience to God's ultimate authority, he fulfilled what he said he would do. And he used a wicked nation. A wicked king at this time, I think Nebuchadnezzar does finally become a believer, but a wicked king at this time to come and take them captive. But I want you to hear it from God's own word. Go to Jeremiah 25. Now, I'm going somewhere because I wish I could tell you that this might never happen to us as a nation. And I'm not sure it won't. I think it may. If we head in this direction, well, he's already given us over. The Bible says in Romans chapter one, one of the evidences that he's given us over is the men with men and women with women and all the shameful lusts and all that stuff. He's already given us over to our shameful lusts, but there's more judgment to come, I'm afraid. Listen to Jeremiah 25 verses one through 12. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That was in the year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. The first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Which Jeremiah the prophet spoke to all the people of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. For 23 years, from the 13th of Josiah, year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, to this day the word of the Lord has come to me. And I have spoken persistently to you, but you haven't listened. You have neither listened nor inclined your ears to hear, although the Lord persistently sent to you all his servants, the prophets, saying, Turn now every one of you from his evil way and evil deeds and dwell upon the land that the Lord has given you to you and your fathers from of old and forever. Do not go out after other gods to serve and worship them or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. Yet you have li not listened to me, declares the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger and with the work of your hands to your own harm. 
Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. What does it say? My servant. And I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. And I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will banish from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, and the voice of bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstone and the light of the lamp. He goes on and says, this whole land shall become a ruin and a waste and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I'll punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. So listen, God says to the nation of Israel, I've been calling out to you and you're not listening. And because you haven't listened, I've told you there's going to be a judgment and you're going to be removed from the land and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to use my servant, Nebuchadnezzar. And because of the word of the Lord, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego submitted themselves to the ultimate authority when they were taken captive because this, well, you would have no authority over me, Nebuchadnezzar, unless it was given to you by my father. Isn't that what Jesus said? Let me say something to you as well. The nation of Israel wanted a king just like every other nation around them. And God says, you, you don't want a king. They said, no, no, we really do. And he gave them what they wanted. And he told them, they're not rejecting you, Samuel, they're rejecting me. Oh, by the way, does the Bible say that God determines which way elections go? By the way, if you don't know your Bibles, the Bible says very clearly, we already read it earlier, God determines who goes into power and who doesn't. He's given us what we've asked for, what we've wanted as a nation. Go to Jeremiah 27. Look at verses 1 through 7. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus, says the, thus the Lord said to me, make yourself satraps, oh, sorry, not satraps, straps and yoke bars and put them on your neck. Send word to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of the sons of Ammon, the king of Tyre and the king of Sidon by the hand of the envoys who have come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. Give them this charge for their masters. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, this is what you shall say to your masters. It is I, by my great power and my outstretched arm, have, have made the earth, who have made, who made the earth, with the men and the animals that are on the earth, and I give it to whomever it seems right to me. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And I have given him also the beasts of the field to serve him. All the nations shall serve him and his son and his grandson until the time of his own land comes. Then many nations and great kings shall make him their slave. God says, I'm going to use him as my servant to bring judgment on you as a nation, Israel. Oh, I'll deal with him and their sin when that time comes. But I'm using a wicked nation to bring judgment on you. Go to Jeremiah 43. Jeremiah 43. Look at verses 8 through 13. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in Taphanes. Take your hands in your hands large stones and hide them in the mortar in the pavement that's at the entrance to Pharaoh's palace in Taphanes in the sight of the men of Judah and say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will send and take Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, there it is again, my servant, and I will set his throne above these stones. And I've hid that I've hidden and he'll spread his royal canopy over them. He shall come and strike the land of Egypt, giving over to the pestilence, those who are doomed to the pestilence, to the captivity, those who are doomed to captivity and the sword, those who are doomed to the sword. I shall kindle a fire in the temples of the gods of Egypt and he shall burn them and carry them away captive. And he shall clean the land of Egypt as a shepherd cleans his cloak of vermin and he shall go away from there in peace. He shall break the obelisks of the Heliopolis, which is in the land of Egypt, and the temples of the gods of Egypt he shall burn with fire. So again, God says, Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. Let me ask you a question. When God was speaking through Jeremiah about Nebuchadnezzar, was Nebuchadnezzar a believer? No, no Nebuchadnezzar was a proud, egotistical guy that thought he was the king and he was the God of gods. And God used him to bring judgment on a nation that he had warned. A lot of, over the years as a pastor, I've heard people not like the fact that 
When God brought the nation of Israel out of Egypt into the land that he had promised them, he had them kill everybody. Why would the God that loves people kill everybody? Well, if we read our Bibles, you'll know that back in Genesis, God comes and speaks to, in chapter 15, you can go look at it later on for the sake of time, we need to wrap up. But in Genesis 15, verses 12 through 16, God comes and speaks to Abraham. He actually walks between the pieces to prove that what he says is going to happen. And he says to him, know this for certain, that your descendants will go into a land and be in slavery for 400 years. But after that time, they will come out with great wealth. But the sin of the Amorites has not reached its full measure. When God said it's time and the Amorites had had opportunity to respond to the light that God had been revealing to them of who he was. And by the way, I promise you the Ammonites, Ammonites and the Amorites knew who God was because they even said when the Israelites show up, we've heard of your God. But let me say this to you. God used the nation of Israel as a judgment against those nations. But then he judged the nation of Israel for their wickedness with another nation. Governments are not only instituted by God, he uses them whenever he chooses and whichever ones he chooses to bring judgment on peoples when he determines that time, their time of opportunity is done. You've heard me say this to you for years. I've studied prophecy intently. I don't see the United States mentioned in the last days. And if we were to just look at what's going on in our nation, Folks, as one person said years ago, if God weren't, doesn't judge America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Let me say this to you. What then should be our response in these days? We need to submit ourselves to the ultimate authority. And sometimes that may mean submitting to the authorities that are over us for the sake of God's authority. And you're going to need to have wisdom to know when his spirit shows you when and how to do that. And I'm going to tell you, start practicing it just in your homes. Start practicing it in your churches and let God show you how to trust them and trust him and trust your leaders in, in the church and trust him. And then when it comes time in the government, you trust God as you submit. But there will be times when they will clearly say you must do X and that X clearly is against the word of God. In those instances, the spirit of God will give you the understanding and the boldness to rebel. Be careful. Like I said at the beginning, we have a problem. We all still want to be God. I actually had a conversation with the Lord two weeks ago where I was talking to him about how he provides for our ministry. And I trust him, but I don't. I've lived this way for years where I'm excited when there's gifts to the ministry and nervous if there aren't. And I tell the Lord, I'm tired of the roller coaster. I just, I want to, and the Lord says, trust me. And I say, Lord, I do, but I really don't. And then as I thought about it some more, it hit me. I really do trust that he'll take care of me. He's promised that and he's proven it over the years. But listen, I don't like how he does it sometimes. Amen. Exactly. You just quoted Matthew chapter 11, verse 6. Blessed is he who's not offended by me. You know, God said he'll supply all our needs, but he doesn't say he won't make you a little bit nervous. Because he's testing our faith. And then it hit me. God, I believe you'll take care of me. But I want you to take care of me the way I want you to take care of me. I call you Lord. But I want to be in charge. By the way, we all got that. Martha had it. Lord, tell my sister to help me. She calls him Lord and then bosses him around. Folks, let's not worry about the big picture just yet. God's got that under control. Amen. Let's submit ourselves in our homes because of God's authority. It's a voluntary submission. And let's submit ourselves in our churches because of God's authority. And he'll show us how that's going to play out in our government in the days to come. I love you. We'll see you next week. Thanks for coming.